Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So what I would like I would like to try to do in the next 20 minutes or so is to focus in the, give an overview of what we know about genomic of CLL. As many of you, you know, it's a very exciting time in the field. And more importantly, how we can translate or what is the clinical utility of those uh, findings. So, and the way that I think to to separate or, 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 or the learning objectives is to focus in four major topics. So we'll start doing a brief review of what is the approaches that we have acquired in, in the study of the cancer in the last few years. Uh, and as a consequence of that, what is the new uh, uh, um, abnormality that has been identified in the disease, more importantly, where what we can do with that information at the clinical level to see where is the significance of them. And finally, something that we have talked this morning, we have heard several speakers talk, is about clonal heterogeneity and evolution of the disease, how that fits in the clinical and why that is so important when we are thinking in the future of treating patients in a more personalized way. So this is, no, but for all of you, I'd like to see, call this like the pre-genomic era, uh, this is still the gold standard, it's very important uh, in the risk assessment, and it's based, as you many know, for the last 15 years from the German group, based on the, um, the status of four different um, uh, regions identified by FISH. There are another, this is a very oversimplified version, but we know we were, how important was the IGVH status as well as, well as P53. But what next after that is this is a very exciting time because the new approaches, as I say, have revolutionized the study of the cancer genome overall. So I'd like to always try to put this uh, slide to give an, uh, an idea when we are talking about FISH versus CGH versus sequencing, what we are targeting. So the way that we analyze us in FISH from the last 15 years, we were the, we are able to focus in a specific region. The resolution isn't great. Uh, and the other big limitation of the fish is that we can, we have a very unbiased idea of what is going on. So combinations, we are talking about four or five different regions, but we are basically focusing, this is a chromosome on a very specific region of that, and we have no idea what is going on in the remaining of the genome. When we are going, going in resolution, in the last 10 years, there is a new technique that we have been using this the first unbiased comprehensive to analyze the whole genome where the array base SNP and array CGH, which to give you an idea is like to analyze the genome with one million to two million different fish probes simultaneously, the whole genome, and we have an idea of the copy number of those regions. And more recently, as more of you are aware, is the introduction of the next generation sequencing that that again provides an extremely powerful tool to analyze the genome. So a very f brief uh, comments about the array base. We were very excited at the time that we started working with this. As I said, it's the first unbiased approach that we had for analyzing the genome. But I have to say that at the time, we were a little disappointed with the results that we obtained. Uh, we thought that would be a big breakthrough when we incorporate, especially comparing with other hin malignancies at different solid tumors uh, that we identify significantly uh, key pathways and genes. That, was, that wasn't the case in CLL, I have to say. And our knowledge about the basics of the CLL genome didn't change dramatically compared with FISH. But we learned, though, a couple of very important lessons. And again, for the first time analyzing the whole genome in high resolution, we were able to understand that the genomic complexity is a very important uh, thing to, to be uh, taken into account. And for the first time, we did this longitudinal analysis, and we start understanding what was the clonal heterogeneity and clonal architecture over time in the CLL genome. And this is probably most of you have seen, but the big, definitely the big changer in the way that we analyze the disease is the next generation sequencing. So this is from the National Human Genome Research Institute, what it shows what is the cost per genome. So let's say that you, 15 years ago, just before the first human genome was sequenced, you wanna have 
a sequence, uh, uh, a genome sequence that will cost around $100 million. It's amazingly, after 15 years, we are finally very close to the hit to, to be a, a genome per $1,000. And I put, what I try to add here are specific key events, like for example, when the next generation sequencing technology center, how it start plummeting the price. The first cancer genome was actually an AML that was only six years ago. It's amazing to believe that just so many things have happened in such a short period of time. And in the last three, four years, because of the facility, many, initially many uh, large size based on consortium, and finally, many investigator driving uh, projects have been done in many diseases. And of course, CLL is not the exception. So since, officially since yesterday, yesterday were published two different papers in Nature with two large cohorts. So we can say, and actually I up, uh, update this um, slide two days ago, but we say we have more than 1,000 gene, 1,000 exomes officially sequenced. Uh, and that is a lot of excitement. We can say statistically we, we are probably not missing any single mutation that is in two or three percent of the genome. Of course, there is a long tail below that, but we have a very good confidence in that level. Of course, the challenge, and here the challenge is how we organize that data, right? So here this is a way that we have to represent what is the prevalence of each of those mutations. You see at the top, like we were, have been talking a lot about SF31, Notch, uh, ATM, and other P53. Um, but one of the challenges was to separate what Dr. Forman was saying this, uh, this morning about the driver genes versus the remaining, which is the noise, or we call the passengers, that they don't have a specific effect on the disease. And it's clear, like we were saying as well, there is not a unique event that is shared by all the cases. Instead of that, we have multiple genes in between 15% and lower, and that they belong to many pathways. Some of them share about many diseases, like the RAS pathway or DNA damage response, but we have some more specific, like NF-kappa-B pathway inflammatory based on the B cell biology, as well as the notch signaling and the RNA export, uh, RNA processing and export. Of course, now in the post-genomic era, how we can incorporate that knowledge into the clinic. So what I will try to cover very quickly is this different uh, challenge that we have. One of those is the risk assess assessment, how we can introduce those in the different uh, indices and risk stratification that we have currently. Uh, if we can identify mutations that are associated with drug refractory or response, understanding more the, new th the, the current and the new therapies, uh, what about actionable mutation? Today, in the day of the um, personalized medicine, that is something very powerful. Uh, but also, how deep we can go with this powerful technology and we, how early in the disease and how small is the clones that we can identify by using these approaches. And finally, talking about the clonal uh, um, evolution as well. Uh, I'm going very quickly about that. Everybody knows how important is P53. That is the gene that by far the most studied, probably the gene that is affecting more cancers across different cancers. Uh, and it's clear, it's a clear consensus that that don't, doesn't benefit from chemoimmunotherapy approaches and needs to be in other approaches. Uh, but just a subset of cases that they show refractoriness, they have mutations in P53. The remaining, as was very nice present by Dr. Foreman, I, I'm not going to stop here, but SF31, Notch1, and Berg3, those are the other three genes that has been very, very analyzed in, in the last few years across different studies and looking uh, trying to understand more about what is the effect of that. The clinical relevance is still, uh, in, in between studies, we, we still see some, some discrepancies, but it's clear that the SF31 is associated with the short treat, uh, time to treatment and overall survival. It seems like Notch1, they have some studies showing that it, they don't benefit with rituximab therapy, and finally, the Berg3, is, it seems to be enriched in the refractory. But the thing that is interesting as well, and just to complement what was discussed this morning, is that in, in the outcome, uh, what 
the Italian group did is try to integrate the mutational with the already established cytogenetic model. So what they did with a score of, of, of around 700 cases, they analyzed initially the, the cytogenetic stratification, and by using, by integrating in the poor prognosis besides P53, they had BERG3 mutations, they identify a second group where is besides 11Q deletions, they have SF31 and notch. The third group, the moderately um, intermediate, is normal or trisomy 12, and the good prognosis is 13Q. As in this specific co cohort, it looks like the incorporation of genes helps to refine the differences in between the groups. There are another German group that uh, reproduced that. There are some so overlapping in between groups, but the whole concept is that that can be hopefully implemented and to help to refine those, those approaches, those uh, algorithm, algorithms for prognostication. Definitely something interesting, and again, based on the few recent papers, is now we have such a big number, we can start focusing in and understanding a little more about which genes are potentially targetable by novel therapies. So if we see the three common stages from the preclinical to clinical trials to FDA approved, we see that they, there's a handful of those genes, even the more recurrent ones. And as a matter of fact, one of these papers that came yesterday, they were saying the Spaniard group, they were in, including, uh, being a little speculative, but they say that up to 40% of their cases, they have at least one gene that is potentially targetable by, um, target, by, by specific therapies, which is very exciting, very provocative. Um, this has been, but about using genomics for analyzing the resistance and again, going fast because we, we already saw something of this, but clearly the B-cell receptor targeting is the, one of the most exciting um, pathway that has been currently uh, explored. And what we have here is in the cases that they have resistant to BTK inhibitors, we see a specific mutation in BTK as well as many mutation in the gene that is downstream of what where is target, which is PLC gamma 2. This is a kind of, uh, not only there are, folk, uh, there are uh, recurrent mutations, the one in asterisk stain, that multiple cases they present the one, so uh, reinforcing the importance of those, but also the concept that give the, uh, one more time, the importance of the clonality and the heterogeneity is that uh, there are some patients where we see that there are multiple clones, multiple subclones having different mutations in PCL gamma 2. There's a concept called convergent evolution, and it's the way that a cell tries to circumvent a specific, um, a specific approaches. Thank you. A specific ways, for example, the, the treatment and how the cell can try to, uh, to circumvent those characteristics. And that that, that drive us to talk a little more and see, put some effort to understand what is the clone architecture of CLL. And from the last three years, our group and several other ones have basically identified two different types of clonal architecture, which is the one that's called a linear evolution, which is basically a single clone characterized by the acquisition of additional abnormalities or mutations over time, which are here represented by different letters. Whereas the other one, which is called the branched or multi-branched evolution, is basically multiple genetic subclones that they are evolving in parallel fashion, which they have some shared abnormalities, but they have a, a, another that distinguish e from each other. More and more we are learning, more and more we are seeing that most of the cases, of course, they are in this group. And that is, of course, is the most challenging one because those are the ones that we need to rethink the way how to uh, target those, those, those cases. So what is the clinical impact of the clonal evolution? So when we look over time, we found, besides those two patterns, when we focus in the multibrank, we found two different ways, which is the clonal stability and what is the clonal evolution. Clonal stability is basically like this example where we're seeing that over time, we see that there are slight changes, can be appearance of one or other, but 
the, 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 the dominance usually is one subclon, and they are kind of maintaining stable over time. Finally, a couple of years ago, the group from Dana Farber put that in a paper, start quantifying what are those effects. And what they found from six cases is that in cases that are untreated, most of these cases, they, they remain stable over time. But the different, it's very different when we put uh, selective pressure such as strong as a chemotherapy. So the equation is different when the cases are treated. Most of them, we are seeing this kind of event where from that we have a bottleneck and we have, after relapse, we have the outgrowth of a different clone. Usually, and the most important at the, at the point of, of the therapy, the outcome, those are highly fit uh, subclones that probably because an empty niche, they start outgrowing, and those usually are more resistant to secondary therapies. And uh, another very important finding of this is in most of the cases, we found that this outgrow clone after therapy was already present before the therapy. So those are mostly the cases are pre-existent. And another relevant thing is what we can say about that is when this same group from Dana Farber, they quantify, they look for these subclonal mutations in some of these driver genes. And what they see is that in case of the presence of mutation in driver genes in the subclonal level, that was associated with a worse clinical outcome, type two treatment and type two retreatment. What we try to do in the last couple of years, my group and other groups is trying to go even deeper. This is a very powerful technology. And what we try to do is say, what about most of the exome studies, what we are doing is we are sequencing around 60 to 80 times each nucleotide. So we can have a good idea of subclones that are present in up to 10% or 5% of the cells. But what we are doing is an approach where we targeted sequencing. So we are selecting 30 to 40 genes, and we are going, uh, sorry, this is not a fault, it's 10 times more. So instead of 90 to 100x, we are going 900 to 1,000x. So what allows us, and this is again in the drivers, what we're seeing by, what we're showing in this histogram is each one line correspond to one mutation. And this is the percentage of cases with those mutations present. And we saw that a third of those, they are in a limit that probably they are not even picked today by the technology of exons. And we know that going deeper and deeper, this long tail is, will be more and more relevant. And why is this important at the clinical level? Well, the Italian group was the first one proving that in the specific case of P53, for example, it doesn't really matter the size of the subclone as long as it's there. So even the small subclones, they have the same unfavorable prognostic impact as the clonal one. So what they did in this group in the last year, what they did is they compared the unmutated versus in, in yellow are the clonal, so we are present in all the cells. And you have a group which are the subclonal, and in some cases as low as 0.3% of the cell. And it's clear the data show that the prognosis is, they, they, they analyze over time, they saw that they outgrow, and they saw that the prognosis is unfavorable. What we try to do as well using this approach in the last couple of years as well is trying to understand in the whole concept of the clonality. This is a paper we, we published early this year, but we start seeing and start thinking about this, the, the, how to approach patients based on different therapies. But what I have here is the two subclones. These are the genetic abnormalities found, and these are the ti specific time point. This is a, was part of the PCR trial in the myeloma, in, sorry, in, in the Mayo cohort. And initially, we see more than 99% of the cells. This is retrospective, of course, we identify later. But that case was treated with immunotherapy, and this disappeared over time, but they have appeared a very, very aggressive subclone that at the end wasn't responding to secondary therapies and this patient uh, passed away. But when we look in detail, we were able by this approach, we were able to identify that was already present and was in less than 0.5% of the cells. And there are two very interesting observations here. One is the, that in this one, we have the presence of a notch mutation and we have a P53, we already know 
especially PIF three, they don't benefit. So knowing that information in the future probably will tell us a different strategy, not chemomonotherapy or at least a combination, trying to not only attach the most dominant clone, but also the one that seems to be the more aggressive, which at the beginning is a very small one. And the other thing that we still don't understand, but we are seeing more and more commonly in CLL, is the convergent evolution affecting multiple genes. So if you pay attention here, this case is characterized by mutations in DDX, SF31, and deletion 11. The, the second subclone, they have the same combination, but they are different mutations. So it's clear, and going back to the point that we, have not, we don't have a unique pathway that is a driven disease, but definitely there are a subset of cases that there are a combination of mutations that seems to be uh, giving advantage to that specific case. And that is something we found, because we found in multiple cases, and we think it's extremely interesting in the future to think and, and, and to study if, if further. With the same approach, um, by the last, is if we can go very small, we can go also very early in the disease. So that's what we tried to, we did in the last year, say, well, we focus in the high count MBLs, and we look at 20 few genes that they are the drivers, and we analyze and we compare the data with the CLL. And the thing that we identify here is in most of the cases, up to six to seven years before we have a progression to right uh, higher than zero, is that the profile is very similar. The, the subclone are smaller, but we see most of the mutation. With rare, rare exception, like for example, P53, that we know that is associated with the progression as well as notch. But in most of the drivers that we are seeing, they are already present in early stages of the disease, or, or the pre-malignant stages, I have to say. And again, that is we, what we try to do with the same cohort is we, this is a preliminary analysis but we, that were presented this year at ASH, but we, we try to use the same parameters, say, well, if we can identify very early the presence of mutations with the poor prognostic or the identification of a clonal growth or a subclonal growth, can we predict uh, a shorter time of treatment? As a matter of fact, that is the case in this cohort. Of course, we need larger cohorts, but this is very promising, that the idea of going starting in pre-malignant and having a very good idea what will be the next stage. So with all the things that I have talked, I think that putting in the same pot all the information that we have, still we need to learn a lot more. But considering the price that is so, has dropped significantly, and all the information we envision in the very short term, helping and providing to the physicians is something, and I know there are some institutions that are already doing this, but how compelling can be approach where we can prove what are a, a, a report where we have all the actionable variants that are present in that specific case. We can look for variants that are associated with drug resistance as well as prognosis. Uh, interesting enough, these same sequencing approaches, they are getting better and better identify copy number changes as well. So probably in the same needs for the development, but probably we will be able to do also the copy number in the same approach, as well as miscellaneous gene. There are many others that we still don't have a complete understanding. And the interesting thing of this is this is, can be all fit on a single test for the future. So I hope that in this talk I, I went through and I tried to reinforce some concepts of how the technological advances and and we are not talking about other things that are coming, but this is extremely exciting time to analyze the genome and see how we can introduce that in the clinic. We have a group of genes that we know that are currently integrated or they are very close to be integrated in the prognostication. And again, as I just said, this genomic test, clinically meaningful information, can provide clinical meaningful information for most of the cases, improving the disease prognostication models, screening for mutations that confer resistance, actionable mutations, looking in very big detail about the tumor heterogeneity and evolution, going very, very early in the pre-malignant stages of the disease and identifying the subclones, the small subclones, and looking at that over time. So 
So thank you very much for your attention.